Hi, good evening. Welcome. Welcome to Liz Real Talk. Hi. Okay. So by now you Oh, look, look, really looking forward to this week's streaming. Excellent. Okay, I'm looking forward to it too. Um, I have been preparing all day today. So by now you have all heard about the man who protested in Beijing on the bridge. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about what really happened. Then we're going to talk about what does this man want, what his uh, goal is. And then we'll talk about what does this mean to Xi Jinping and the CCP. And lastly, we'll talk about why Xi Jinping is able to hold on to power despite so much opposition. Um, so without further ado, I'll get started, okay? All right, so let me share this. Here we go. So what happened in Beijing on October 13th? It was actually the last day of the seventh plenary session of the CCP's 19th Party Congress. Uh, it's the, you know, it's, it's the last session. It's uh, meant to prepare for the 20th Party Congress. So it happened at 2 p.m. that afternoon. And um, so a man by the name of uh, Peng Zai, Zhou, actually his, his, um, his real name is not that. That's just his nickname online. He put up four banners, three on the left that you could see, um, one on the right, and basically... What he said on the banner is uh, something something along, along the line, we want food but not COVID test. We want freedom but not lockdowns. We want dignity, dignity and no lies. We want reforms but not cultural revolution. We want votes um, and not a paramount leader. Uh, and and he said, don't, we don't want to be a slave. We want to be citizens. So here's actually a video. Let me see if you can. Uh, I want to play that video. So the, the picture that you see, this is what people see on the, on the highway. But this video is actually, uh, this video is actually from, the, from, from top of the, the, the bridge. You can actually see people, uh, there's a tire burning to maximize the impact of his banners, he uh, he had a loudspeaker broadcasting his message and also burned a tire or maybe tires uh, that created the smoke. And so this view is actually from top of the, the bridge. You can see that the banners are already taken down. The, the tires are still burning. Uh, there are security people, firemen who try to put out the fire. Uh, so that yeah, here's the the banner. They tried to take down the banners. It's, it's actually already taken down. Uh, so this bridge is called the Stone Bridge, and it's actually in a very busy uh, district of Beijing. Uh, there's a hotel called Friendship Hotel that's right next to the bridge where the delegates of the, the Party Congress reside. Um, actually... Okay, that's the end of the video. Let me let me come back. Remove. I am back. Okay, so let me uh, just show this picture. So this bridge, Stone Bridge, actually has a connection to the 1989 students' movement that resulted in the Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, the name Stone came from the company, uh, Stone, uh, Stone Company. It was a high-tech company that was as famous as Huawei now. Uh, it, was, it was established in the 1980s and was probably the most famous high-tech company back then. Uh, the founder of the Stone Company, uh, the, 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 the bridge was named after the Stone Company because they, they provide the financial means to build the bridge. But the founder of the company, um, Wan Runnan was accused of being the person behind the 1989 student movement. And so he was uh, wanted uh, after the, the Tiananmen Square massacre. So he exiled, he left China, exiled to France. So this bridge, the stone bridge, uh, brings back the memory to many Chinese who went through that stretch of history. So to the young Chinese who were born after 1989 or even 1990s, they probably don't know uh, the, the history of, of this bridge. So that just 
I think make the, the regime even more nervous. Um, so who is this man, right? So who is this man who, who did this? So that's his poster. Uh, his, his real name is Peng Li Fa, and he used the name Peng Zai Zhou uh, as kind of his online name. He's 48 years old. He's a, a, a technical person. He works for a high-tech uh, internet high tech company in Beijing. He is from Heilongjiang, uh, which is in the northeast of China. And there's a picture showing him with his wife and daughter. So he apparently has a a, a, a school aged daughter who should be in the in the elementary school. So that's the person who who protested, put out the banners, protested. So. The next question is, what does this man want by doing this, right? Well, he obviously has planned for this for a long time. So he set up a Twitter account uh, in April this year, so six months ago. And right before he, <clears throat> he took action <clears throat> last Thursday, or this Thursday, uh, he sent out this tweet. He basically said, uh, we're about to begin. We, I hope, or well, we hope you can uh, send this out. So he called out a strike, a nationwide strike, on uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, which is October the sixteenth, the first day of the Party Congress. Yeah, he, he called for a general strike, general uh, strike all classes, strike work. Uh, he asked the military to. To, to rise and um, and he said the purpose is to let dictator Xi Jinping know that China has real men uh, in in their pursuit of freedom, and then he provided a link uh, for his overthrow Xi Jinping strategy, and it's at um, a link that was linked to ResearchGate ResearchGate.net. So this is this is what's on now. The, the information is already taken down, uh, but before it was taken down, this is what people uh, saved: the image of his post or his the, the his strategy, the document of his strategy. And he used the name. He he, his, he used his name, and then the organization is the PRC General Election Committee. Um, <clears throat> and then the description of the, of his document or his paper, uh, I just translated the parts that are highlighted. Basically, he has everything. He has uh, it's his crusade against he called a national bandit or a thief. Uh, he has a whole strategy. He even has an election platform. He's a plan for how to run China. And um, so it's it's a whole bunch of um, documents. I actually have a I have a snapshot of 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 this. Hold on, yeah. Uh, this is if you can read Chinese. Hold on, if you can read Chinese, I'll just quickly show you. It's just a lot of a lot of information. I'm just scrolling. I'm am I scrolling backwards? Yeah, it's it's a lot of he, there's a. Let me just go back to the top. It's it's a lot of information. He has the banner. This is the banner he designed. He designed a flyer, um, more flyers that want that want freedom. These are the flyers he designed. Uh, he's this flyer is for all citizens. This flyer is for drivers. He asked drivers to. Uh, blow their car horns. Um, and then this is a flyer for the military and the police. Uh, so more flyers. Oh, uh, yeah. And then he has like detailed protest methods of protest. You know, what do you do? Uh, you could give out flyers, give, put out banners, burn tires, roadblocks, um, basically all kinds of things. Uh, his uh, slogan. Uh, <laughs> this is his table of contents. You can see how how much contents he has out there. Okay, so this is taken down, but but that's what he put out. Um, in addition to the banners on the bridge of Beijing. So let's see. 
And he wrote a long letter to his fellow Chinese. And the, the letter is signed by two organizations. You can see the two red seals, right? So these two organizations are, uh, it's one is the CCP, it's called the Chinese Communist Party Free Election Committee. And the other is China's General Election Committee. So he somehow uh, put out the, the, the open letter uh, on behalf of these two organizations. And here are two paragraphs that he wrote to introduce what the two organizations are. Basically, the CCP Free Election Committee is an organization comprised of CCP members who want to elect their party leader, you know, the, the what do you call that? Not chairman, the, 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 the secretary general. And then the other organization, the China's General Election Committee, is an organization, he said, uh, is comprised of tens of millions of Chinese who love China. And their goal is to hold a general election to elect their head of state. So, um, yes, so there are two organizations that's, that he is uh, how to say, speaking on, be on behalf of, uh, and here you see the two seals, right, two official seals here. All right, so what's his political views? So I kind of read his long open letters, and it's interesting, he's definitely echoing the views of the reformists. So here he said, um, he said, from 1978, in the 44 years from 1978 to the present, uh, the Chinese people are at a crossroad again. And if we remain silent and allow Xi Jinping's uh, dictatorship to continue um, for the rest of his life, then everything we have uh, might be gone. And then we'll have to return, go back to, uh, we'll have to return to before the, ref the, the economic reforms. So he seems to, uh, be echoing the political views of the reformists. And on the right, he uh, he said, he basically said, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, language kind of ridicule Xi Jinping. He basically said Xi Jinping has not done anything. He's basically getting a free ride based on the accomplishments of his predecessors. Um, so so his political views more is more of... Um, it sounds like he he is on the side of his predecessors and he is on the side of the reformists and he's not against the ccp he's not against the regime uh he 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 is he's supportive of the communist party uh he is just against xi jinping his entire documents his entire political platform seems to be uh, focusing on Xi Jinping and Xi Jinping alone. Of course, he's also um, uh, criticizing all the policies, you know, the CCP policies. Um, but it seems that he's putting the focus on Xi Jinping. And uh, for example, I noticed that he really, really put a focus on the military and the police force or the public security forces. So for example, this is his open letter. And on, on the top, I, I translate the title. It says, A Letter to Fellow Chinese. And then see how, take a look at how he addressed the people. The first line is fellow military and public security personnel, and then fellow policemen, and then fellow Chinese from all walks of life. So it seems that he addressed all the, pol the police and the military people first. And then in the letter, when he used the red font to emphasize here, I want to tell all my fellow Chinese, again, he addressed the military personnel, policemen, and then the party members and the media people. And the list goes on. The list is actually very, very long. But again, he addressed the military first. And then in his letter, the only bold face, like the, 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 the text, the characters that are in bold face, are this, again, is addressing to military. You know, he said, Xi Jinping has turned people's military into his own hitmen and turned police and security forces into his own bodyguards. Um, so I was just, I found it interesting, like he is, he is, he is broadcasting his message loud and clear to Chinese PLA, obviously. 
And here in his in, in his in, in his um, strategy document, he has um, a page called uh, "Principles of Kang Yi Yuanzi," the principles of our protest, right? So he talked about in the early stage of the protest, it should be decentralized so that the dictator cannot focus. Um, like he, he basically suggests that it should be everywhere. And then in the end, he said we should we should then centralize to uh, to surround the CCTV station, to occupy Tiananmen Square, to put Zhongnan Hai, the leadership compound, under siege. I mean that's his his words. I'm 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 paraphrasing what he's saying there. And then the red tax again. He said the focus is to let. Uh, military, uh, uh, the the military servicemen, police, um, um, security, armed, what do you call the security forces and government officials to receive this information, so that they can be on the side of the protesters. And he even and he said he hoped to have to see a military leader who step out will drive out the dictator, meaning Xi Jinping. So this guy is openly calling for a military coup. I think that's what his language is suggesting. So what does this mean to the CCP? Um, well, of course, you know, it's, it's uh, I don't think they have seen anything like this in the past 10 years. Um, so suddenly all the key words like uh, the name of the bridge, uh, Stone Bridge, is censored. Actually, there was a there's a song, a Chinese song called Stone Bridge. That song is not to be played anywhere. And then there's a song uh, that was popular. It, it was actually a song written to, uh, dedicated to the 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 COVID, the 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 fight against COVID. It's called uh, Long Warrior, right? Gu Yongzhe, Long Warrior, and it's banned. Um, so anything that has anything to do with the Beijing, you know, that has any connotation that's close to the protest is banned. Um, I saw a post where someone said in Chinese, which means, which in English means I saw it, like three words, I saw it. And that post, that person who made that comment, uh, his, his account or her account was suspended for six days. And within 24 hours, I heard that over 600,000, somewhere between 600,000 and a million uh, WeChat accounts are permanently banned. And over 100,000 groups, um, online groups, are permanently banned. So they said that they, this, is, this probably broke the record in the history of WeChat. They have never closed that many accounts, right? But if you really think about it, um, Oh, and all, and also they're hiring. Well, you, the pictures you see here are what they call the bridge watchers. You see how there's a tent. There's a, a tent in the top left corner. They set up on the. I think it's a overpass. It's not even a bridge. I mean, Chinese call that a bridge. Yeah, it's an overpass, like a walk overpass. Um, they set up a tent so they have people keep an eye on everyone, and they have volunteers. You have people wearing. Vest, vests, jackets that says militiamen, Chinese militiamen, mingbing. I, I don't know what you call that. It's like, yeah, m m militia. And then, so basically, uh, the government is uh, hiring people to to watch all the bridges, and they offer three hundred twenty, between two hundred sixty to three hundred twenty yuan per day, and that's like forty dollars to forty five dollars a day, and they cover their food and lodging. So basically, two people cover a shift, um, two two persons cover a bridge, and for twenty four hours. So I think they take turn. You know, you get twelve hours, the other get twelve hours, and they need to work for the next fifteen days. So I think until the end of the party congress. And then what's even more interesting is um, people who, people who, you can't buy fabric that's over a meter long. You need to, if you want to buy fabric that's over, I think a meter is like more than three yard, um, it's more than a yard, three feet. Uh, if you buy fabric that's longer than that, you need to give your real name. They need to record your real name. Same with paint. You cannot buy paint. 
um, uh, you, I mean, they'll sell it to you, but you need to give your real name. They want to know who has bought paint. So all of that is actually, in my opinion, creating more curiosity, right? So people are going to ask, well, think about all these people whose WeChat accounts are banned. I mean, they're going to ask why, right? All these people who can't search for 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 direction, like address, the stone bridge is gone, or people who can listen to the music or anything. Everyone is going to ask the question, what happened? What's going on? So I don't know if the regime realized the more they censor it like that without reasons, the more curiosity factor they create and the more viral this will go. Um, so I don't know if it, it actually served them any purpose. So, um, and the other thing is, okay, so, and then the other question um, that people are asking is, who is, who is behind this man, right? I mean, everyone is asking, I think Xi Jinping is probably asking, not probably, he is asking that question. Who is behind this man? Did he act alone or there was somebody behind him? And if there were people behind him, who were they or who are they? Are they just individuals like himself who are totally upset with the regime and just decided that they're going to get together and do something? Or uh, was it were they affiliated with Xi's political enemies? So we don't know. Um and but what people mostly are concerned right now is this man's safety because regardless who is who he's affiliated with but he does um he has spoke out he has been the voice for the voiceless and he has risked his life to speak up for the for the chinese people so people are mostly concerned with his safety right now um but if you really think about you know, in in the interest of the regime, like uh, Xi Jinping's people probably, not probably, Xi Jinping's people will protect his life. I don't think his life will be at danger because they want to keep him alive to tell them, you know, what's going on. They want to know every detail, right? Where he bought the pain, who, they want to know everything. So his life is not, um, he, he, they will keep him alive. But if there was indeed a conspiracy theory, maybe those who there, there are people who don't want him to live, who knows? Um, so, so people who are generally concerned about um, China do worry about this man's safety um, because it is, it is a, a, a tremendous it was it's a tremendous protest and effort that he put out there so then the the next question is which what do you think will scare the regime or xi jinping more um do you think if it's just individuals private citizens who got together and really want to make a statement um if it's if it's private citizens is that with that would they frighten the regime more, or if it's she's political enemy, um, taking advantage of some disgruntled citizens and um, and then put out this a stage of this protest. So what do you think is more threatening to Xi Jinping? I I, I should have done a a poll. I, maybe next time. Well, if you really think about it. I think the private citizens getting getting together and and pulled out this this protest is more is more threatening because if it's Xi Jinping's political enemy, it's something that she has been dealing with for the past ten years, and this will actually give him the perfect excuse to strike down his political enemy, right? So this whole protest would just provide Xi Jinping a legitimate reason to strike them down because he said, well, it's threatening the regime um, and it's it's illegal. So, so he does not fear that at all. 
it will be, it's deadly fearful to them if it's private citizens getting together and, 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 and did this. And, and I think it's not, not only threatening to Xi Jinping and, and his faction, it's threatening to all CCP leaders, regardless which faction they belong to. Uh, it just shows that private citizens um, are, um, they just basically is making a statement. They've had enough, right? So, um, but we don't know. We don't know who's really behind that man. Um, right, here's a picture of the, of the guy. So, I talked to some, it's very interesting. I talked to some uh, Chinese political commentators who are based outside China. And these are the people who are most vocal about the CCP. And I noticed that they kind of are very quiet. They don't talk about who could possibly be uh, affiliated with this man. So I noticed that and I asked, I asked one, I said, why you guys don't talk about who could possibly be working with this guy? And he told me, he said, well, if you do, he said, Lei, you know, you need to be careful uh, if you get into that because people could attack you. People who support the free, uh, who support the pro-democracy movement in China, who, who people who support these, um, these heroes, right? These uh, heroic Chinese people who dare to speak up will accuse you for, um, you know, for whatever, for, for showing lack of support and who trying to talk about who's behind them. And so he said, that's why we kind of don't want to get into that. And I suddenly understand, you know, these people, it's very difficult for them because when they out, when they are outspoken against the CCP, then the CCP, the Wu Mao, the, the little pinks, right, the trolls attack them. And then when they try to analyze, well, who could possibly be working with this guy? And then those pro-democracy um, individuals or people who are supportive of, of pro-democracy movements could find them to be a little bit too hard on these individuals. So I think the political correctness, unfortunately, is everywhere today. So um, so I decided to, to mention it. I think I, I really... Uh, I think we should be able to talk about everything because we play the role of political analyst. So my job is to show you all the information that's possible, right? All the possibilities. And we're not um, making conclusions here, but my job is to giving you all the possibilities or at least what I see. Um, so I hope the label of being politically correct is not being put on my head. I I truly admire this man's courage. I think he is, he's tremendously heroic, but, um, but unfortunately CCP's politics is more complex than what meets the eye. And to do my job well, I have to um, give you the whole, you know, the whole story from both angles because I see that as my responsibility. But I Find one comment from this Japanese. Um, here you see a, a, a journalist. He's a Japanese journalist based in Taiwan. He's the um, head of, he's the director of Sunkei News in the Taipei branch. And he grew up, he was born and raised in China. So he's, Chinese is his native language. He's very knowledgeable about CCP politics. But because he's a Japanese journalist based in Taipei, so I kind of want to see his view on, on that, right? On, on the man, on who is the man, who's possibly uh, be affiliated with this man. Um, because I think maybe he could be not affected by the, pressure to be politically correct because he's Japanese. He's Japanese. So based on this interview he did with a, uh, a Taiwanese interview, he, uh, he find it hard to believe that a man working alone can pull off such a, uh, a complex protest at a, such a sens sensitive time in downtown Beijing. So he find that really hard to believe. So he tend to believe that he's 
he obviously has somebody behind him. Um, he said that when he was in Beijing during sense, you know, major party events, the government or the CCP took such painstaking security measures, like his building was facing, his, his building is for foreign nationals, and if the windows face Chang'an Jie, you know, the main road that leading to the Tiananmen Square, and he said all the windows were boarded up before the, the big event. So he said it was, the security um, usually is so high, so the fact that this whole thing happened, and it happened so perfectly, exactly, it's f- executed exactly according to plan, he found it hard to believe. So I just want to, I'm not making conclusions. Uh, I just want to share with you what I found uh, to be interesting. Okay, so now the next question is, so there's so many people, obviously there's so many people against Xi Jinping, right? Um, Let's not talk about how is he able to still hold on to power and consolidate power when he faces so much opposition. So let me bring myself back. I think that that's the end of my presentation. So if you look at the history of the CCP leaders, even Mao Zedong, I mean, Mao Zedong had a lot of enemies, but he had these enemies throughout different um, stages in his political career. He didn't have them all at one time. So he may have this enemy at this time during this political campaign and, and another one and another time. And sometimes he tried to befriend his, his enemy. But if you look at Xi Jinping, he has everyone turning against him or opposing him at the same time. So he's in a situation that's even worse than Mao Zedong. But how how is he able to hold on to power, right? So uh, if you look at the people who, who oppose Xi Jinping, you have the reformists, you have the party elders, you have the princelings, um, you have the officials who who were struck down during his anti-corruption campaigns, right? You have private businessmen, uh, you have the pro-democracy people, uh, the people who were persecuted, like underground Christians, uh, Falun Gong, uh, Uyghurs, right? And then, and then even the far left Maoists don't like him because they think he's not left enough. He's not Mao enough. So he has everyone basically uh, opposing him. And but how could he hold on to power? You know, indefinitely. It, it looks like it, right? I mean, at least from what you know, what we can see um, before the the. 20th Party Congress. Uh, A Chinese journalist, a Chinese, yeah, he um, now based in in the US, his name is Deng Deng Liwen. He wrote uh, an opinion in Voice of of America, and he kind of gave his six reasons. And I found his six reasons to be, um, I kind of agree with him. So I want to share his views with you. So he said, the first reason is she has incorporated his ideas and his wills into the CCP laws, or he has turned his ideas and wills into laws and rules, party rules. So if people oppose him or oppose his ideas, then you are opposing the party. And um, I made a video just to explain that whole concept, and it will come out next week. So stay tuned. I explain very uh, in detail how, how, how Xi Jinping turned um, how he used the 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 apparatus of the CCP apparatus to um, to solidify his power. The, I think the video will be called "How Xi Jinping Became Mao the Second. So stay tuned; it will come out next week. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is uh, we, we've mentioned this before: Xi Jinping controlled the entire CCP apparatus. Most importantly, the high tech digital uh, surveillance system that uses AI and uh, and he basically can gather information about, you know, who has said what, with whom, at what time. And uh, I think there's somebody told me that there's a rule that anytime CCP of more than, when you have more than three officials that get, that gather together, you need to report it. I don't know if it's an official rule or unofficial rule, but I heard it somewhere. And so for that reason, the officials, the CCP leaders don't like to get together a lot because they want to stay out of trouble, or at least the ones that don't want to get into trouble um, 
want to avoid that. So it's very hard for people to to form an alliance or to be associated with each other um, because they're being watched digitally. And the third reason is um, if they are openly against Xi Jinping, then Xi Jinping will accuse them of being separatists, right, who try to divide the party. And it's a big political label and that people are afraid of, you know. And so, and on the other hand, they share the same goal as Xi Jinping to save the party. They don't want the party to collapse because that's what their career has been all about. So they're afraid to be called a separatist or, um, or, or someone that caused a division. And, um, and then also they try to, basically they try to not to be accused that they're causing the collapse of the, of the party. And then the fourth reason is many, many um, officials are corrupt and they're afraid of the knife, the anti-corruption knife that Xi Jinping is waving at them. So, you know, they'd better say, well, you know, <laughs> I'd better not say anything and just go along, right? I don't want to be noticed. And the fifth reason is, even though Xi Jinping has a lot of people opposing him, he does have supporters. Um, who are his supporters? Well, those people who, have, who he has promoted in the past 10 years um, throughout the government, in local and central government. Those people are his supporters. And also those people who want to be supported, right? Who want to get a job or get ahead with their, uh, with their career, they are going to go along with Xi Jinping. And also people in the lower social strata um, in China tend to support him, the, the poorer people. And even... Um, Mr. Dunn said in his article that lower ranking military officers um, tend to support Xi Jinping. So he does have a group, a, a, a group of people in society that support him. And the last reason I think is a very practical reason is those people are afraid to lose what they have. They know that if Xi Jinping falls, the regime may collapse. And if the regime collapse, their wealth and prestige, which they have collected, may also evaporate. Um, so even though they know what Xi Jinping is doing is wrong or not good, they're going to go along with it and not say anything just to have a good, just to hold on to their good life. And um, they don't want that to be taken away from them. And that's true for the government officials. And that's also true for a lot of the relative wealthy people or relatively wealthy people. Um, so, um, and also a lot of Chinese, you know, out of fear, they just don't see their action or their outspokenness would, 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 would gain anything, you know, so they just give up. But this, this is actually um, a mentality after the 1989 student movement, because in the late 1980s, Chinese people, um, aspire to a, a free China. They really aspire to a better future for their for their country, for their children. And then having seen what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989, people just lost hope. They just um, do not want to be involved in politics anymore. So everybody turned to money. And they saw money, having money, making money, having money is practical, is what they should focus on. And they just don't care about um, the political direction or the where the country is going. And that is a very sad but brutal reality in China. So with that said, um, I think this man's courage is admirable, regardless who is behind him. He is risking his life um, to be the voice for the voiceless. And... Um, and he is a beacon of light in China, and I think people people have people have seen it, uh, and things may start to change from now on. Uh, as far as how the politics, CCP's politics, will evolve from here, and who is really behind this man, I think maybe we'll never know. Um, 
but maybe we'll we can tell next week and see how the 20th Party Congress will unfold. So I think we just keep we we just have to keep our eyes on it. So that's what I will say. Well, I've talked for 40 minutes. I talk a lot. So um, let's see if people have any, have any questions for me. Let me go back to see if I have any super questions, super stickers. Well, it's relatively quiet tonight. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. All right. Um, I'll just take a, a few questions. Um, all right. Okay. So, all right. Somebody suggests that I block this Don Domfrey guy. Okay. Let's block him. Oh, did I block the wrong person? Sorry. I, I blocked the wrong person. Oh, sorry. I'm not very good at this. Whoever I accidentally blocked, I, my apologies to you. I don't mean that. I'm so sorry. Um, but I blocked that Don person. Um, let me see. Do, do, you ha do we have any questions? Oh, uh, do I accidentally block someone? Sorry. Oh, thank you, Eve. Thank you. Thank you so much for the donation. Okay, from Fro Fro Featherstone. Thank you so much for this video and for all the others too. Your analysis is so valuable. Oh, thank you. I, I try. Thank you, Madi85. I love your comment that you're gonna you like to open a bar so you could broadcast my Saturday night live. <laughs> I really love that idea. All right, let's see. Um, I blocked that Dong guy once before, and then somehow he came back. Um, uh, let's see. Any questions for me? Shouldn't the, oh here's a question from Thomas Rhodes. Shouldn't the CCP try to find a subversive group shouldn't this this one voice is much more dangerous than the target frog well sorry where did that question go um i don't understand the complexity of chinese culture i don't understand what you mean by should ccp try to find a subversive group ccp is afraid of subversive groups and they think it thinks everyone is subversive so it's scared of every everyone. And this guy is just is making a daring statement. I mean, look, just look at the, his political platform. He's, you know, um, oh, thank you, Cubs win 2012. Thank you. All right. I'll, I'll keep trying. From Fred Fowler, why is the CCP so afraid of just one guy with some sheets and paint? <laughs> Okay, yeah. Well, CCP is afraid of everyone. <laughs> uh, that's just their nature. Because it knows it has done too many bad things. It's coming back. It's bad karma coming back at them. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you heard when I said that you can't buy paint and sheets in uh, fabric in China without giving your name. You have to register if you buy fabric that's more than a, a meter long. And somebody said that they can't do that. What if people buy a shorter piece of cloth and maybe they just use their sheets and they sew it, right? You could sew shorter like sheets together to make it a, like a huge banner. So are they going to ban like needles, <laughs> sewing kits? So it's like, it's, it's impossible. It just shows you like the more they ban everything, it's it's only causing backfire. It's just, yeah. All right. Uh, because it only takes one person to get the truth into the light and start a movement. Okay. That's, I agree. Uh, let's see. If she is replaced, who would replace him? That's actually the predicament. And I think that's that would be the seventh reason why sh she is still there, even though people don't like him. Because, um, 
I mean, within within the party, because you see this this man who risked his life to make a statement, he still believes in communism. He still believes CCP is good, right? He still, he's not against the communist party. He's not against the regime. He's just against Xi Jinping. So he thinks, well, as long as we have someone who allows us to vote, the CCP can exist. But he doesn't understand the communist party will not let you vote. It will let you vote, but it's it's not, it's a manipulated vote. Just like what Putin did in 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 the four uh, regions, right? They, they said, "Well, we have an election, you vote, and here's the results." But is that really a, a real election? So, so this man still thinks CCP. There's nothing wrong with the CCP, but the problem is there's no one within the system that can challenge Xi Jinping. Like no one in the system. So the only people who can pose a real threat, that's why my argument is as long as you hold on to the communist regime, you don't pose a threat to Xi Jinping. He is the most powerful leader within the CCP universe, shall we say, or world, right? So you, if, you, if you hold on, if you want to keep the CCP system, you can nobody can challenge him. The only way you can pose a real threat is you abolish the communist regime. We say we don't want communism, you know, uh, or we could, you could keep the communism. Let's have another party. We could we could have a mul multiple party, you know, election. You know, everyone could have their own platform. If CCP is one of them, that's fine. So, so um, yeah. That's, so that's why I think no one, no one can pose any threat. No one within the CCP system can pose a threat to Xi Jinping for the reasons I mentioned above. From Best Right, uh, can you like, can you do a video of all China nationals that have purchased and laundered their money in the US? Most are connected to the CCP one way or the other. I don't, I think the US government knows that, right? I think the US government knows, knows who's, who who is here? Who is who? Um, so they have all that information. So, yeah. And I don't know. I don't know who who those people are. Don't forget from Hirosh Hiroshi Nagoya. Don't forget to hit the like button. Okay, good, excellent. Um, let's see. Um. From Peter Longland, CCP is afraid that if one person stands up to them, other may follow. The CCP won't be able to stop the masses. Yeah. Um, from John Paul Young, well, would you accept merit? One is poor. What does that mean? John Smith, my chuang dan, yes, by, by bed sheets. Yeah. All right, wow, there's so many questions. I need to scroll down. Um, okay, from William Warren, thank you. Great video. Thank you for explaining this occurrence in detail. You're most welcome. Okay, from, from Rudy, um, thank you. Thank you for the super sticker for the donation. Um, so, yeah, I, I uh, question, thumbs up. If you have property, lay. If you have property in China, would it be hard to sell it right now? Oh, um, I made a video about how the the high end and the ultra high end properties market in China are really hot right now. Uh, it was a video that I made last week. Was it last week or the week before? It's only a couple of videos ago. It's amazing, you know. All the the, the real estate market is like is tanking in China, but the the uh, the the super wealthy people are treating high-end um, properties as liquid assets. It's, it's, uh, it's, it defies logic. Who would spend tens? And then the more expensive it is, the more liquid they think it is. Um, so, so they are, these, these wealthy people are buying like 
uber luxury real estate properties in like the major cities like Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen as liquid assets. The the reason is because the government has a, a policy um, that limit the number of large mansions they could build in these um, metropolitan areas. So they think it's a rarity, like the, the, the large mansions will become fewer and fewer. And Chinese have this mentality that if something becomes a scarce, uh, then, it, you know, the, when the supply is diminishing, then it becomes a hot commodity. But I think these people are taking a huge risk in putting their tens of millions of yuan into a, in, into a luxury mansion. So <laughs> it just, there's so many things in China that defies logic. All right. Uh, Lei, what do you think about our current U.S. government allowing China to open police stations in some major U.S. cities? Your thoughts on that? Yes. I wanted to make a video, and then I've been, I have so many other things keep coming up, so I'm going to make a video on that. Most people, it, it is outrageous, right? It is outrageous. And most people talk about it from the perspective of uh, national security. Uh, there's a reason why CCP does that. And there's one reason the CCP is doing that for, and I think a lot of people, I have not seen anyone talking about it, but I figured it out and I'll make a video next week. It will come out. Uh, it, it's actually a very smart strategy for the CCP. I mean, it not only, you know, infiltrates the Western society, it has a, a presence uh, in our society. It, it uh, like in one, in one of the reports by Safeguard Defenders, I think that's the organization that issued the report, it kind of, it does re-education sessions for Chinese nationals or people who they want to re-educate in the, in the United States. So it could do, it could do similar things that it does in China here in, 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 in the U.S. But there's another reason uh, that CCP is doing this. And I just, it just hit me. And I, I, I want to save it for my video. I want you guys to watch my video. It's coming out next week. Um, if everything goes well, I will write the script tomorrow. Um, yeah, it's, they're very sneaky. Yeah. But it's, it's, a. Uh, we, we should stop them for sure. We should definitely stop them. Um, okay. All righty, it's, um, I'll take one more question and I think I will end it. Lei, I think you forget a significant factor, Chinese mentality. They are very obedient and their most important value is money, safety and national proud. She is selling them the future. Um, that is true. I kind of touched on that, you know, obedient, but hist historically, Chinese are very obedient, but Chinese people are courageous. Um, I think many Chinese have been corrupted by the CCP, so they become very short-sighted. Ch even Chinese call themselves, they are the refined egoists, meaning they're very smart. They know how to get things their way they know how to get their goals accomplished but they only think out for themselves and that's the, maybe that's the mentality that you're referring to it's the mentality i only care about me and my family i because i can only look after myself but if everyone in society thinks like that it's, you know this society has no future and that's exactly what's happening in china if ever you know try, they just they just watch out for themselves and for their for their kids. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that will be it. Uh, if you have questions, you could post them in the comment sections. All righty. I thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your Saturday night. And I shall see you next Saturday. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.